Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Hey, Mike. Hi. Excuse me, my microphone was not on. Okay, the recording has already begun, um, but let's just make sure we're, you know, all, uh, oops, ready to yeah. go here. And, um, excellent. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Mike, for taking uh, time to join us this morning and do this uh, little kind of first installment of our uh, of our little podcast. Okay, <clears throat> glad to be here. I hope it's worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, me too. too. Yeah, I'm sure it definitely is, for sure. Yeah, and my name is Derek. I'm an inspirant of Terrasim, and I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Yeah, my name is uh, Gabriel Rothblatt, also known as Swami G, Terrace and Movement Trans Religion. And I'd like to welcome everybody here, uh, my co-host Derek, and our first guest, Michael Perry, uh, with the Alcor organization. And so, so um, Mike, why don't you, uh, you know, start off, just give your uh, kind of a brief introduction on yourself. All right. I'm Mike Perry. I work at Alcor Foundation, which is a cryonics organization in Scottsdale, Arizona. I've worked here for many years, and it just so happens that I do a lot of different things, but one thing that we do is, well, cryonics is the, the practice of uh, uh, storing people after their legal death uh, at uh, cryogenic temperature. Most of our people are stored at liquid nitrogen temperature, which is 320 degrees below zero Fahrenheit or 196 below Celsius. At, at a temperature like that, essentially biological activity is halted. So there's no decay or deterioration over time. And our hope is that someday technology will be advanced enough to revive these people in some reasonable way. Uh, a That's lot is awesome. Still, still uh, unknown, but yeah. anyway. Absolutely, yeah. And let's like maybe break that down into, you know, cause some smaller chunks uh, for, um, you know, whoever's gonna, you know, watch this, you know, in, in the future. Um, and so, Starting off, you know, cryonics, you you explained a little bit liquid nitrogen. We, you know, kind of take the these bodies and and keep them super cooled. Um, so our storage, we can, you know, maybe reanimate them um in in the future. Um so let's what what does the process look like kind of from like time of death to you know, getting into what this we would call the doer, where the body right. is put. Yeah, I, I can say why we call it a doer, because a gentleman named James Dewar back in the 1890s was involved in the early experiments with cryogenic liquids, but getting cold liquids very, you know, liquefying air, liquefying oxygen and nitrogen and so on, something they hadn't been able to do up to that point. They needed a container to hold this stuff because it was so cold that compared to it, our surrounding temperature is like a blast furnace. And so they needed something to put it in, put the liquid in so it wouldn't boil away within a minute or two. And he developed this kind of a double walled container. The same principle you see in a, a thermos bottle today. Uh, and it's also scaled up to a large size to for our containers that we hold uh, our uh, patients as we call them in and uh, it, it greatly slows the uh, boiling of the cold liquid inside but it is going to eventually evaporate according to the laws of thermodynamics so we have to keep replenishing it but anyway it's called a doer after James Dewar and so you want to know Dewar. About, yeah is there any relation to you know of James Dewar? Is this with Dewar's whiskey? 
I believe there is, yes. It has some connection. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is, but he must have been involved in more than just cryogenic liquids. But, well, I just had I had a feeling that maybe it was something about the technology, you know, um, around. No, no, you know, I'm not sure about that, but anyway. Interesting. We'll have to do uh, another series in, know, on the deep dives. Of you want to know about what is done. First of all, uh, for legal reasons, the our patient would have to be pronounced legally dead, de legally deceased, I think is the right term I use. And then we go to work and basically all we're trying to do is get them as cold as possible, as fast as possible to minimize any kind of deterioration that might happen. However, it would be a bad idea to just put them in a container of liquid nitrogen and quench them down. And it would be quick, all right, but you get a lot of problems with that shell fracturing and everything. Uh, so what we do is we we replace the, the blood and body fluids with a uh, cryoprotective agent, a kind of antifreeze that protects tissues against freezing damage. So if you just freeze tissue, you'll have a lot of ice crystals forming and they they cause a lot of damage to the cells so we want to minimize that as far as possible and uh, so this perfusion process goes on it may take an hour or two it's, it's done at, at near water ice temperature so even there we're, we're trying to hold down any kind of uh, deterioration get the patient as cold as we can in, in a practical sense. And uh, finally, with the cryoprotection in place, we start cooling them down to cryogenic temperature. And we try, we go slowly. Well, actually, our procedure calls for a rapid cool down to about 110 below Celsius. And uh, we think there isn't a great deal of damage that happens going like that. But after that, it's only one degree per hour because you're uh, the, the tissue, which is still got some amount of liquid in it, solidifies and it is subject to cracking and so on. To minimize any cracking, we go slowly. Minus 110 is pretty cold though. Dry ice is about minus 78 Celsius. So it's way below dry ice temperature. Anyway, so. So, so it sounds stages. like what you're, if, if I can uh, jump in there, it sounds yeah. like, um, you know, to kind of, you know, break this down that, you know, the freezing process, um, you know, you're, you're trying to, there's a trade off that you have between right. kind of, you know, the necrosis that happens in a decaying body versus like the bursting of a cell from, from the freezing of it. But I'm also yeah. picking up on kind of a nuance in this freezing process, which is that, you know, that it's not just about getting to zero, that, you know, even after the point of, you know, 32 Fahrenheit, zero Celsius, That's right. that that there still is is maybe cell damage that can be caused by deeper freezing um, right. than simply that that point that we know as like the freezing point of water. That's correct. At the freezing point of water, there's going to be a lot of liquid still present. And uh, the colder you get, the less liquid until finally, I think all traces of any liquid are gone at minus 110, or very nearly. So, this is interesting too. Would, would I, I know in, in this case, would it improve the process, you know, particularly for someone who's planning to enter into cryopreservation, you know, with some degree of, of dehydration um, beforehand, you know, be complementary to the freezing process? That's an issue that's been debated back and forth. Some say yes, and some say it would not be a good thing. And, uh, there probably, uh, there can be dehydration, whether you want it or not, because you are refusing, you're pumping liquid in, to the patient, you're taking liquid out. If the rate of outflow is greater than the rate of inflow. That means you've got a net loss of liquid. So effectively, you've got dehydration there. 
we have had that happen too. On the other hand, suppose that the rate of outflow is less than the rate of inflow, then you get what's called edema or swelling, you get too much. That's generally a bad thing. We, we don't aim for that at all. But it's kind of a delicate balance to, to have the right inflow and outflow. And there's some differences of opinion about what exactly that would be. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, Mike, like, um, what are some of the things that you do uh, in your day-to-day -day work at Alcor? Well, I check the doers each day, which doesn't take that long. Uh, another thing is that we do have to cool our people down, and that's called a cool down. And we, not, we need to have somebody on site 24 hours for that, or very near to it. We have some amount of electronic monitoring of cool downs too, but uh, as it turns out right now, I'm involved in that. I'm, I'm monitoring a cool down. And we have crew quarters here for that. So people spend the night here. I spent the last night here. So that's another thing I do. Besides that, I do things like writing articles for Gryonics Magazine. I've, there are many articles I've written that you can see in the back issues of our newsletter. The newsletter is called Cryonics. Uh, and uh, other than that, I, I keep some records. I keep records on the people that we have here. Uh, and in general, whatever they want me to do, I end up being something of a jack of all trades at some level, not, not a, an extremely advanced level in many cases. I'm not a technical person, really. I do have a background in computer science and mathematics, and I'm even working on, I've done some mathematical studies that have actually appeared in Bryonics Magazine. And years ago, I did some programming for our cool down system, but eventually we got a professional in here who was an expert with LabVIEW. And so we, our systems are based on that now. But in the earlier days, they were based on a lot of stuff that I did. How old am I? I'm 76. <laughs> I may That's as well not, not hide it. I've been around a long time in cryonics. I started working at Alcor in 1987. Alcor really didn't have a, a structure for employees. It had no employees officially, but I, a generous benefactor provided a, a little stipend. I was able to live on and, and be here. Uh, we were in Riverside, California back then. We moved to our present location in 1994. So yeah. We've been with Alcor a long time. Yeah, you know, they, I want to, in the, in the span of this conversation, um, kind of bring in some of your history and engagement with, with other organizations. Um, but maybe for the moment, let's let's stick with the cryonics and and I I, I want to um, pick up uh, where where we were going and talk about you know what is the current effectiveness of cryonics and and maybe what are the you know maybe the metrics that are used to judge that effectiveness right now. I can say a little bit about especially what you say metrics, but uh, well, uh, you might ask what creatures have been revived from cryopreservation? And the answer is, at least there are some multicellular creatures that have been revived. The most significant one was is this nematode worm, uh, Cenorhabditis elegans or C. elegans, which is widely used in research uh, because it's easy to cultivate these tiny little creatures. And uh, they're tiny, all right, but they're big enough to see about a millimeter in length, I believe. And uh, some years ago, there was two researchers uh, who were able to uh, freeze these cre creatures down and cool them down to liquid nitrogen temperature. And, thaw them out and uh, observe retention of memories. So they had these creatures trained to go to a food source 
And after the thawing out, they went back to that food source rather than going the other direction. So they had a, a T-shaped pathway and a creature that didn't remember anything should go about randomly on, in either direction. But these creatures showed a strong preference for the one that had the food direction that had the food source. And they got this result with freezing, just straight freezing as well as with cryoprotection. So with these tiny little creatures, it didn't make that much difference if you had this cryoprotection point, um, which uh, is supposed to minimize freezing damage. You didn't get that much freezing damage with something this small. But all right, so you, you show that you can preserve memories by freezing, by either straight freezing or cryoprotection. But we're not C. elegans, and even a mouse is not a C. elegans. So we haven't got a mouse back yet. A lot of people think you're never going to get a mouse back. They're just talking science fiction. But we don't think so because we do preserve the fine structure of the brain with what we're doing down to the molecular level. That's a lot of information. And if nothing else, I have, I'm one of these people that, that puts some hopes in something called a molecular scan. That would be that you take a solid object and you find a way to map it down to the molecular level. You get every, essentially every atom, you know where every atom is. Uh, we can only do that with very small pieces of matter today, not even a C. elegans. We're not anywhere close to that. But with the promise of nanotechnology and other technologies of the future, we think eventually we'll be able to do that. We might even have to break a large specimen into smaller pieces to do that, but we can do that. I mean, if you take a phone book and rip it into different sections, it's still got its information in it, right? Even if you tear it up into small pieces, you could probably fit those pieces back together. Well, there, has, there is a limit to how far you can go that way, but still, um, I, for one, am very hopeful about the molecular scan. Once you have that, you should be able to feed all the information that you got from that brain into a fancy computer of the future, better than computers of today. And it, you tell it what you want it to come up with. You want it to come up with a, a structure that ought to be there from what you and what really is there. And, uh, so you should be able to get a mapping of what this brain would look like if there had been no freezing, no damage, and the person had just been in good health to begin with. With their memories and everything, you would have to infer those memories from what you have. That sounds like probably a very long shot, but uh, you know, we reached the moon, didn't we? From yeah. the year 1800, <clears throat> the first lunar landing, in 1800, it would have seemed impossible that we would get to the moon or people had fanciful ideas like using a hot air balloon or something that we know will not be workable. But, so I'm optimistic. Well, you ask about metrics. One metric we try to have is we recognize that it's not a good thing to have a patient sitting around at, at a warm temperature for a long time. That's where you get your deterioration. And so we... We come up with a, a sort of measure of ischemic ex exposure or MIX, a standardized measure of ischemic exposure or SMIX. And it's, it's a number that's equivalent to how many hours they were there at body temperature. So an SMIX of one would be saying they had as much. An ischemic exposure is what you get if you're not oxygenating tissue or, or inadequately oxygenating tissue. Uh, so if they're laying there legally dead, they're getting ischemic exposure. And actually they can get it even if their heart is still beating, if it's not beating very well. But uh, so if you have an S mix of one that is, we, we say at least it's equivalent to being one hour, uh, at body temperature with no blood circulation or anything. And uh, naturally, we want to minimize the S mix. We also have to estimate what 
would be an S mix at different temperatures besides body temperature and under different conditions, like what if you're perfusing them, what if you're oxygenating the tissue, that's something we often do. Uh, that should lessen the S mix. And how the, there are many uncertainties about how you would estimate a reasonable S mix, but we, we are now getting S mixes for all our patients based on uh, how long they were at which temperature, whether you were perfusing with, whether you were trying to oxygenate the tissue in the course of perfusion, what, what your protocol was and so on. But typically the S mix is coming out for the good cases around between one and two hours. We'd like to get it better, but it's not so easy. Uh, we have to deal with hospitals, we have to deal with regulations, with laws, and we also have to deal with the fact that a lot of people don't really prepare too well for their own deanimation, as we call it, your own entry into the state of legal death. They might be living alone in an apartment, you know, someone, uh, and that's especially common with aging cryonesis. A lot of those people didn't get married, they didn't have any children, they have no close relatives. And sad to say, we learn about them because somebody knocked on their door when they weren't answering the phone. And it turns out they'd been in there for two or three days in a state of cardiac arrest. If, they're, yeah. if they've been there long enough, it turns out that you can't just perfuse tissue if it's been sitting there too long because of clotting. If, they, if they're clotted and everything, we, we just straight freeze them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mike, if I can... If I can jump in a little bit, um, yeah. your answer is like quite technical, right? And so this is, I think, um, maybe kind of challenging my, for, <laughs> I for people to in, say generally something. to understand. In my background, yeah. it doesn't. It seems quite untechnical. I'm <laughs> I'm leaving out the real technical details. Believe me, but I yeah, realize sure. you, uh, what yeah. you're saying is valid. That other people listening from the outside might be put off yeah. by what I'm saying. Well, I don't think put off. I I think it takes some studying. Um, but you know, I'm curious. Like, since you've you've been a part of chronics for so long, and, and, you know, in your career, you know, have you kind of seen or what do you assess the public sentiment to be? You know, throughout the years, and what do you think are some of the kind of maybe accurate and inaccurate beliefs that people have about cryonics? And maybe what do you say? Right. Like if you meet new people, say, hi, I'm Mike, and I do something. What do you do? Yeah. I usually, I have found that it usually isn't, it doesn't seem to work too well if I am proactive about it. But they, some people ask me, well, what do you do for a living? We get into a discussion of cryonics that way. Uh, um, I think a lot of people just say, well, I never... You know, not even a mouse has ever been revived. Maybe a, a little worm has been, but we're certainly not little worms. We're not even mice. So even if you got a mouse back, a lot of people might not be convinced that you could scale that up to the human level. I think people are particularly ignorant about the informational side of this whole thing. And I tried to introduce that, but I suppose... You would say that is getting pretty technical too, the molecular scan of the brain. But like it or not, I think that's going to play an important part in actually reviving people. People, a lot, even people in cryonics have the idea. I think a lot of people think, well, you're you're just almost like as if you were asleep uh, when you're a cryo preserved, especially as a whole body, and uh, uh, a little bit of rewarming and a little bit of this and that will make it possible for you to open your eyes and carry on. And yeah, we'll have to have a little bit of fear of our aging too, but we'll probably get that too because most of our people are, are somewhat elderly, but they don't take into account the tremendous amount of additional technology that's going to be needed. And I, I do think that the molecular scan is going to be part of it. But on the other hand, if you did that, and you, got, you assume that you've got your advanced computer, you could just load the information into a computer and do what we call a whole brain emulation, 
a WBE, and you could probably bring the person back in some reasonable sense as a software entity inside the computer. Some people are highly favorable to that and some are highly opposed to that. And some try to use that as a reason why cryonics can't possibly work because you would have to do something like that and it wouldn't be them, it would only be a copy and a copy of you is not you, they would say. It's a philosophical it's, point. It's a, yeah, philosophically. It's, it, you can say it either it's actually, way. You can't it's actually prove a psychological a we, we're actually, it's a psychological point as, as well. Point. We're having, it touches on two things here. One is, is psychology of aging. And, and I think this is something, you know, uh, that, that we, um, you know, there's a psychology, the closer you get to the death, your perception and relationship with time changes. Um, you can actually become more appreciative because you're more living in the now than always focused on the future as you when you were young. Um, but this radical kind of longevity, you know, can actually change the psychology um, that you live in because your relationship, um, you know, to, to that has, uh, you know, has, has changed. That's right. Um, I think as people get older, including the aging Guyanas, as they their whole uh, outlook kind of narrows down and they don't think so much about, hey, you know, I want to get good cryopreservation. They just go from day to day and then they rest. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to maybe maintain yeah, that right. long, long, long term view. We're trying still to try, have a, a vital signs, a wearable vital signs monitor. There seem to be some of those out there. There might be good ones, but most of us don't have anything like that. I don't even have anything like that. I get I get two calls a day from two different sources right now. Are you okay? So that would be good to keep me from going for 24 hours in a state of arrest, but it wouldn't stop me from going for five or six hours. So that's that's pretty much as far along as we've gotten. Some people as we start say, to, sorry, Mike. Yeah, as we start to shift into like where this is going, um, you know, I I don't want to lose focus of this one point where, um, you know, maybe we talk a little bit about how reanimation is present in nature. You know, similar, you know, and uh, hibernation, um, right. and and perhaps are we are we is is you know we we can observe in nature some complex life, complex intelligent life that can survive, you know, winter, uh, 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 right. a severe dry it, period. You want me to talk right? about that a little bit? I well, and then I guess, that. yeah, yeah, that would, that would be great. I mean, what maybe we can learn um, from this and maybe is there anything that is different than what is happening at cry in terms of like super freezing, which is that maybe we can observe this at, you know, at, at maybe negative 40 degrees, but at negative 100 degrees Celsius, you know, is, are you maybe doing something that's unsurvivable at that point? I can, I can speak to that. And I also think that, all right, to start with, if I had enough time, I could tell you an interesting little story about how I, I actually got introduced to the, this whole idea of reviving a frozen organism. I saw it on a, a science fiction show in the 50s and they wanted to demonstrate how, well, this show was about reviving a frozen baby mammoth. And uh, it was on a, a series called Science Fiction Theater. And the name of the show was Dead Storage, which is not a very inspiring name, but that, that was the name of it. I looked that up. They revive a frozen, a, an unusually well-preserved frozen baby mammoth out in the Arctic somewhere. And at the end, they had this host named Truman Bradley, a, a kind of a, an elderly, grandfatherly, kindly man who said, the story you have seen is, is fiction, but there's some science to it too. And what he showed was a goldfish, a big goldfish and a block of ice. And there was a time-lapse uh, series where that ice melts and the fish swims out. And fish do that. Some, uh, even ancient writers noted that. They can do that. And now 
they have found a kind of frog that I can tell you the scientific name of it. It's Rana sylvatica and it lives in Canada. And it undergoes some kind of a freezing process too like that. When it gets cold, it's cold enough that you can pick one of these up and drop it gently on a counter and it goes ping, just like it was made of porcelain. It's that, that close to being frozen. But in fact, the fish and the frogs do not freeze 100%. And deep within them is, is a core that isn't frozen. But they are partly frozen. And they do endure freezing temperatures uh, in the winter that way. They survive winter. So a lot of, and that's been uh, cited as well. If they can do like that, then we can uh, freeze our people like that. And with a, granted that they don't revive uh, now, um, but, but aren't we kind of close to uh, being able to revive them of these, uh, these creatures? Then there's also hibernation. Everybody's familiar with where a bear, for instance, will undergo a very uh, great reduction of its metabolism rate and uh, last out a winter that way with a very if it sleep through a winter that way and uh, they don't freeze though but um, as far as I know but uh, anyway there is a great divide really between what we're doing and what uh, the, the frogs and the fish are doing I think there are some snakes that do that too and uh, when you freeze the tissues and you have to freeze the tissue all the way if you had one of these frogs and tried to keep it like that for a year, for 10 years, it probably would die in that period of time. It's still undergoing some metabolism. So we couldn't store our people like that. We got to freeze them absolutely solid, you know, at cryogenic temperature. And uh, when you do that, uh, you do introduce changes that are, are hard to reverse. You can take small, uh, you can take one single cell and uh, you, you can thaw that out and sometimes it revives. If you take more, a larger piece of tissue with more cells, you get a less, less chance that it's all going to revive. And very quickly, you get to the point where it, it just has, the probability is so tiny, nobody's ever observed it. That's what happens, and each it's difficult to get. When you're reviving one cell, you're just concerned with the metabolism within that cell. But if you have a, a tissue sample with a lot of cells, it's not just each individual cell, but they have to work together in a complicated way. I mean, a complicated way. It's you, you start appreciating just how complicated an organism really is when you get into this. Yeah. This issue, right? Yeah, um, and I would say really we don't assume we're almost there when it comes to reviving people from a cryonic yeah. preservation. We're not almost there. I think I really think we are going to need that full molecular scan. We're going to need to come up with exabytes of of the important stuff in you, and we're going to need to put that into a, a computer that's more advanced than anything we have today. Perhaps it would use quantum computing as well as classical computing. Who knows what it would use? But I think the the chance is very good that we will work right. up to that level. Right. Uh, yeah. And I want to get into some of these other ideas too. And I'd really like to hear, maybe if we can transition a little bit, um, to hear about your book, um, yeah. Forever for All. What is Forever yeah, for can All? You tell me about, yeah, Forever for All. And, um, yeah, how did you get inspired to write this book? And yeah, I love to know inspired. about it. <laughs> got inspired by noting that even if cryonics works, it's, it's not going to help anybody that didn't get cryo reserved. And uh, I, as I grew up, you know, I had, a, I had relatives and I had certain relatives I thought well of, and they were old people. And of course, they weren't interested in this cryonic stuff if they heard about it at all. But Anyway, they they got buried or cremated. So what what about people like that? Is there any hope for getting back people like that? I had this idea that well, uh, 
if you could make a copy of somebody and you could surmount this philosophical problem of whether a copy of you is you, that could be considered as resurrecting somebody, couldn't it? Or reviving somebody. But the problem with doing that is that you have loss of information. So when somebody's buried, they decay, right? Not but also to... humans lose information like in terms of memory right it seems so yeah you can we do forget memories even without anything going on as you get older i mean you forget countless things that are happening all the time around you you're they come it's like it streams in and it streams back out you don't remember most of that but uh, uh, a certain core of uh, things are pretty much remembered by you. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't know who you were or anything. You'd be a total amnesiac. But uh, anyway, what are you going to do about that? And I thought uh, the, the idea I had, there, there are different ideas about that people have. And one is to just say that I call it mining the quantum vacuum, OK? The quantum vacuum is, is outer space, basically. But recognizing that outer empty space really isn't empty, because you can have particles that spontaneously appear, like an electron and a positron. They, they split from nothing. They go back to nothing. Actually, what you have is an electron, a positron, and a photon. And then they can come back together and all all these things cancel each other out but occasionally they don't come back together they, they get out here a ways and that's called a quantum fluctuation and there's speculation that our whole universe is a quantum fluctuation a pretty big one but uh, if you can do that in space empty space is not really empty Maybe there's ways to get back. There is a principle that says that you have information conservation with quantum processes. So more or less, if you can capture every photon that goes out of a process, you could deduce where it all came from and all that information. But how do you chase down photons? They move at the speed of light. So there are people that say, well, our technology isn't equal to that yet, but someday we are going to be able to, to trace down the photons or whatever it takes to get back the brain structure of your great grandmother or anybody in the past, no matter how far back it is, millions of years, our, our uh, you know, hominid ancestors and everything, the dinosaurs, we'll get it all back right. that way. I am skeptical of that, but I propose an alternative that is based on using it's I, mean, I know this is getting technical but it, it it's great uh, keep going it would be i'm sorry for you, you people that are put off if, if i'm sounding too technical but it would use the many worlds theory the many worlds theory says that you got all these parallel branches of reality anyway there's a branch where for instance the the South won the Civil War instead of the North or something like that. All of that, well, we don't observe it because we happen to be in one branch only, but it's out there. So anytime you have a decay process, you have an opposite number of that. You have many, many, many opposite numbers, and it runs through every possibility. So if you use the quantum random number generator to, to recreate somebody who was decayed, what you would do is you, you have the same kind of thing happening in reverse. You got uh, your opposite numbers in the parallel branches would also be doing all that. So you get back every possibility. You start with every possibility, you get back every possibility. So you see how that amounts to a kind of right. reverse. And that's the basic idea. A huge uh, amount of emulations. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would be. Uh, anyway, I thought, all right, if you could do that, in a sense, cryonics isn't even necessary. But on the other hand, I came up with arguments as to why it would be a good thing anyway. And uh, 
Yeah, well, we would need I a thought, path to get there. So if Kronos would be on the way. We're going to need a civilization that is willing to do all of this, too. Right. Being a Kronosist means you can take part in being, you can be part of that civilization rather than you can be a, a, a benefactor. You can be, what do I want to say? You're a benefactor rather than one who benefits. And also it gives you control that you don't have otherwise. I happen to be somebody that's not too comfortable with just saying, all right, we're going to put you in the ground and the soil organisms will finish you off and get some good meals off your brain right. tissue. Aren't you thrilled with that? I have to say I'm not all that thrilled with that idea. And I'd rather do something else that might seem kind of uh, outre too, but it's it's still a process of being in control of what's going on. Uh, so anyway, but let's just say that you take the position that cryonics is not absolutely essential, but it's still better to do that than not to do it. Would that increase the sign up rate and everything? It looks like the answer is it didn't seem to do that. So, so but I'm still glad I wrote the book anyway. And I'm still working on that. Definitely. On it's a mathematical, it really has a mathematical basis. If you start talking about physics and many worlds and everything, you're talking about quantum mm -hmm. mechanics. Yeah. But there's more to be said than just that, too. There's a kind of qualitative mathematics involved in this. I'm working yeah. at the qualitative level now, and I'm, I'm trying to finish a paper that could be published in a referee journal. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. If I can do all that, I want to see if I can go to the real physics level. Yeah, you and know, by the way, um, yeah, by the way, if I can interrupt you a little bit, uh, I know learning that, on my part. I'm yeah. 76, but I don't. I'm <laughs> right. going to try to do it. I don't care how old I am. Right. Yeah, and by the way, I saw that your book is on uh, Ray Kurzweil's website on his reading list. Um, so All I right. thought that was really cool. Yeah. Uh, the book exists in different versions, and there's two versions really. There's one version that you have to pay for, but fortunately. If you get it in well, any way that you get it, you have to pay for this version. And, uh, but fortunately, the the second edition is free. I decided I was going to just make it free online, and uh, I can give you a link to that. I don't have it with me today, but I can get get it to you. I've uh, actually mentioned that at, at some of the terrace meetings. We had a little discussion of this once. And, so it's a book that uh, it's copyrighted, but I say you're free to make copies of this and you're free to use in whole or part, use them in derivative works if you want. So I just about, I, it's all about public domain. Yeah, it's great. That's great. The only thing yeah. that it might say is don't try to, I would say don't try to claim that you have the copyright and I don't. Don't go that far. Right. But, uh, when we when we publish this, I think yeah, we'll include a link to certainly how to how to get to it. Yeah, I think you know the, the work itself is such a you know it's a great summation. It's a great piece of work. I think it answers this one question that we wanted to ask you. the The fact you wrote this book and what you wrote in this book, I think, is a great answer in itself to kind of this question of like, how do you deal with the loss of those who do not plan to cry out? preserve themselves yeah. right because it's like you know for especially for for i think you and, and and others like you like us who you know you you have a very big intellect but you also have a very big heart um you can't that's why you're making this you know free to to others to do because you know you want to 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 kind of share this with them um so i want to kind of use that to pivot and then ask like you know what are your prior preservation plans and um, and, and if I can, you know, uh, you know, 12 years ago, you mentioned the desire to, you know, to preserve your cat, you know, uh, and, and so, you know, what, what's Idaho. happened there? Ido, 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 yeah. I can tell you why his name, Ido, that's a, that was a term from the martial arts. I took a martial arts course once because I thought, well, I'm the patient caretaker, and if, if some bad guys got in, uh, it would be good if I knew something about that. But 
luckily no bad guys ever got in i'm i'm just not my brain isn't good at, at martial arts stuff i'm not good at maneuvering i'm not good at watching people do these things and saying okay here's how you do it because i saw you do it but anyway his name was ido and um, that was my cat and he was cryo preserved well he he was pretty old he was about 19 years old when he was cryo preserved he was ready for it believe me and uh i myself i'm i have arrangements to be cryo preserved i'm going to be a narrower head only because I think I can build back my body. That should be available. I mean, by since they can now make clones of creatures, but that doesn't mean it's going to be exactly a cloning procedure. So people that try to argue against cryonics on grounds that cloning creates the whole thing with a brain and everything. So therefore, it wouldn't work for you. Therefore, your plan isn't going to work. But uh, no. They will, they will create the rest of my body. But actually, I'm thinking that I'll probably wake up as a software bot anyway. I won't even have a body as we understand. It'll seem like I have a body. I'll have a virtual body. And I'll be in a virtual world of some kind. I think I would strongly recommend that they do, do that for me. Uh, I, I just like that idea better. I, I would think. prefer both, for sure. I would prefer to have the possibility of both, but if I was told, well, your physical remains are still in uh, at liquid nitrogen temperature, oh, I might yeah, not that's true. want to wake those up. And I might not, I would say, well, I don't consider that that person's dead and I'm just a copy of that person that has nothing really to, in common with them except similar memories. I, I just don't see it that way. But, uh, uh, yeah i want to come back now, to this because i'm in i'm in my meat body now i'm saying that to this cyber being or whatever you feel free to think that you are me okay <laughs> i'm saying that but everybody is not ready to make that concession anyway no. so i i want to come back to the what i was mentioning earlier about the psychology of self and um you know a little bit how younger people tend to be anticipating the future older people more likely to be in the moment and there is some wellness of the mind that's associated with that but also we have this phenomenon where again when we are young we tend to make decisions because the person we are when we are older, we are psychologically disconnected from. And we're actually a very different person. And, and, and we are saying, that's someone else's problems. You know, when you do something reckless and like in the, you know, when you're young, you're, you're, you're externalizing that onto the, the older you, which I certainly at, at 40, you know, can, you know, am, am reaping the bounties of, right? <laughs> so, yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, right. And so, but I think this, this kind of speaks to this whole argument that is always there, you know, whether it's a replica or it's a 10 years older than you, it's always a completely different person, it's but it's always also the same you, because this you, you know, is a sense of plurality. It is a kind of more of a social construct than like an immediate, uh -huh. you know, location. That's right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I know of a, a certain individual. He was a famous science fiction writer, and he was a something of a scientist too. But he spoke favorably about cryonics. Alcor had a certain crisis called the Dora Kent crisis, where the, it was claimed that we had started a procedure on one of our people named Dora Kent before she was uh, before she had arrested. Okay, so we had to extricate us ourselves from that difficulty and it turned out that we were able to claim that well we did give her metabolic support after arrest and that will produce metabolites in the body as if they were still alive and still getting in oxygen and so forth and in the end no charges were filed against alcor but we needed people to defend what we were doing and this individual came forth and he said something like, it has, in my estimation, 
about a 90% chance of working, but even if not, nobody can say that it won't work. And so what about this person himself? Would he or herself? Would they want to be car preserved? And what they said was, um, you, after 10 years, you become a different person anyway. So in other words, he, he or she was saying, the person I am now is not going to survive no matter what. But different people have different attitudes. For me, it's been always important that I survive. So I go to great lengths to convince myself that I have been the same person, even when I was a tiny infant. If I can remember me, that, that me was, is me today, too, even if there are a lot of differences. But everybody doesn't think like that and i think what gabriel is saying is, has a lot of validity so yeah as chorionicists get older they no yeah. doubt go changes yeah so, and i i agree with you i think like support is you know very important and and we're going to close on the hour but i'd like to you know in that spirit of support talk about terrorism a little bit um yeah. Yeah, because it's it's a community and we support one another too. Uh, and how did you hear about Terrasem? And you know, you participate in the monthly gatherings, and I'd love to know like um, just your experience. I had to. It had to be from some kind of online source. But I I heard of Martine Rothblatt, and little by little, I learned more about Martine. And at some point, I must have seen that she had some kind of movement or something called terrorism so it was an online source uh, i think i there was some talk about her too and it's hard for me to pin it down exactly but mostly though i've learned about it by going online and seeing what is said there the websites and everything good that you have those websites and also i got in, into it more directly because I happen to be a friend of a lady named Karen Eiden, who you probably know about. She has been to some of the terrorism meetings. And uh, on the other hand, she was, she knows a lot of people in baryonics and life extension and so on. And she knew about Martine. And Martine was having some uh, gatherings back oh, about 15 years ago. And I got I'm sure it was with the lobbying of Karen I and I got invited to one of those. I went to two or three of those. They were a sort of precursor of our terrorism meetings today, but they they had to do with the future and uh, what, what the legal issues might be for uh, uh, if you had information about a person that you might want to use to try to reconstruct that person, what kind of legal issues would exist with that and so on and uh anyway it sort of evolved i think i don't think those meetings are still going on i could be wrong but i know terrorism meetings are still going on yeah yeah we've you know it certainly has evolved right you know um terrorism is still terrorism 20 years later but it does seem like a different terrorism um then you know what you saw you know uh, uh then yeah. the colloquiums you know they've kind of changed names the you know then we have the gatherings now the organizations themselves have have changed uh somewhat um i think there's another organization i i i'm just I'm kind of curious because you've 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 been you know on the grounds you know uh you know here in this space for for so long um you've been involved with other groups like society for universal immortalism and i'm curious particularly about your involvement if at all um with life pact and how you see terrorism maybe continuing the work of of life pact okay actually i have to say i haven't been involved with life pact uh, and it's a good organization. I have no objections or anything, but it seems to have the basic idea that uh, uh, you, it's difficult. You would like, like a nice organization sitting there that will just uh, 
take responsibility to try to see that you get revived. And if you are afraid that your cryonics organization could uh, fail, and some have failed, you would like a backup organization of some kind. I think the life pact idea has to do with you getting closely involved with another person and you two have a life pact with each other. You're going to try your best to make sure each other comes back. And uh, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's a good idea, but. Uh, yeah, and I, I think maybe we're Fred and Linda Chamberlain involved. Fred and Linda Chamberlain pact. were the ones that started yeah. life pact. And they're I also never, associated with Alcor. I don't so, think it yeah. got very far as any kind of formal organization if it got to that at all. You could say they, they are each other's life pact member they they have a life pact with each other they might have one with their with fred's uh, son named fred the fourth fred is fred the third his father fred the second is one of our patients unfortunately fred the first died too too soon for cryonics he, he would have to be brought back by one of these other methods of any if, if they can be made to work but uh it seems like that's about the extent of life back. It, it got to be a something that worked for a few people. But there's another organization called the Society for Venturism that was started mainly by David Pizer, with uh, me being a, a sort of second in that. And uh, that had roughly that, the same idea. It would be an organization to watch after cryonics people uh, and also to try to promote the uh, whole idea of life extension and cryonics and everything and to try to incorporate a spiritual element so we got irs status as, as a religious organization 501c3 organization and for a few years we put out a newsletter and uh, you know we were at least minimally active not that active really but we had some conventions. We had uh, we had conferences. We had two big conferences that were called conventions, but it's pretty much uh, an inactive organization now. Yeah. And then there was the Society for Universal Immortalism. It was that is another organization like the others, and uh, it was based more directly on some ideas from my book. And also the idea that we think that the problem of death can be solved in its entirety someday through technological means. And so we were very similar to Terrace and there, uh, but we might have had, I'd say we probably had some more specific ideas about how the revival would happen. It, wouldn't, it certainly would not just be based on uh, cyber information if you had other information like dna we would use every bit of information no matter what but even if you didn't have any of that we would do it in another way and uh yeah that too is is inactive now and uh um, yeah should, and should it be activated mm -hmm. the only thing like that the only organization that's like these that is still going that i know of is terrorism Right, so yeah. Lucky to have a wealthy person backing it. And there's also Gabriel, who is good at, at running things. And I think we we need more Gabriels, really. We do. If we could do some cloning. But, uh, <laughs> anyway. Gabriel oh. needs 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 more Derek's and, and Mike's. <laughs> um, All right. <laughs> but uh no yeah this is this is so, yeah this is such a great conversation uh that we're we're having um and you know there it's it's such a cryonics is so fascinating um but also you know how we approach death and like burial practices um is one of these like cultural markers right it's like it, it's 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 something we look back it's like it's how we judge like did they bury their dead how did they bury their dead right it's so it's an anthropological you know gold mine about like studying the people and 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 so for me i've always seen cryo 
self-preservation as essentially mummification. Um, I also really see, you know, uh, um, the uh, the embalming is essentially a form of mummification, you know, preservation um, of the decaying of the body in a relation to kind of like the service to this continuing relationship um, we have, you know, and this is the 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 early creation of like this soul and this extended presence. Um, because, you know, kind of in this belief systems where maybe, hey, the body's dead, it's just, and they just kind of let it rot, or they'll eat it, or whatever, um, but in this essence, you know, we have really put in so much effort to extend the presence culturally, you know, socially, um, you know, to do this, and I see kind of cryo preservation as um, this, and then this is also why we have these conversations, I think, um, you know, and I think, you know, you probably see this better than anyone, um, Mike, that we have to create these communities, right? Um, because who is going to care, you know, for these mm -hmm. people in the doers? And I also think it, it's, it's a really extension of like, we care for children, we care for each other. And like, we, like we, it's a commitment and like, we're not gonna stop caring, you know, uh, and and this is a way you know um, of of doing that, and but not just through faith, but all through 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 science. That's right, um, right? You know, and and to to I think this is important, um, and I think this goes to you know the existence and the Terra Sam is that you know that science must be a pillar of your faith, or faith yeah. will lead you to a state of delusional you know, um, yeah. you know, reality, right? That's right. Absolutely. I want to touch on one other thing, too, that we didn't uh, get in here, um, which is the fact that you're also um, uh, an accomplished uh, electric, electronic musician. <laughs> and and I think that this isn't, you know, appreciated enough, you know, there's forever for all. But in fact, I think one thing um, that uh, I've actually heard a few of them right now, they're actually beautiful composition pieces. Um, and I, I was listening to the one recently and thinking that in addition to forever for all, these are what we would call in terrorism, authored self. Um, mm -hmm. And that there's a great, you know, essence um, of you that's captured by these compositions. So as we close out, I wonder if maybe you, you know, tell us a little about the inspiration in your process. Uh, I've, I've always loved music. And I've made, I can remember making, you would have to call them childish attempts when I was a child, at trying to compose little pieces of music which didn't go too far, but uh, but I kept that interest up. And when I got to college, um, uh, I I was able, I, I composed some melodies and I could only whistle those melodies because I don't have a background in performing, even though I've got, people say I have a pianist's hands, but I ain't got the nerves going up or something. I'm not, or else I just haven't, done that you know and, and uh but i could whistle a tune okay in fact i wasn't a very good whistler i i got to be better at whistling um just so i could perform some of these tunes but that went on for a few years and then finally i got a tape recorder i could whistle into that tape recorder and i could play it back so i could actually listen to music that i composed well, the next step was to get a computer. And computers were, this by now were maybe in the early 80s or so. And uh, someone got me a little toy computer. It was a VIC-20 computer. That was the first machine I had that could play music. So instead of me whistling it, I could write a program because I had a background in computer science and it could play that score. It was a kind of computer program that just told it to play this note, that note, and it went from there. And really, my composing kind of went from there, too. So I got better equipment, and I did more music, more music. And 
it just kept going like that. So I'm still, I'm totally self-taught as a, an electronic musician. There's a lot that I don't know. And I found it best for me to work with what is called music notation software. And to do that, you take a mouse, you put a note up on the score, another note and another note. And most people don't do it that way. They they play on a keyboard or something like this and it records the notes they play, but I just don't have that ability. And there's some other abilities I don't have. It's, it's not easy for me to look at a score and just tell you what, what melody I'm looking at and whistle that melody or hum that melody. I just can't really do that. I can't make that connection, but I still have a melody in my mind and I can put up notes and listen and I can say, is that what I'm thinking of? No, that note isn't right. I'm going to put that note down a little. Oh yeah, that's it. That's the note right there. Yeah. I just go through that all the way. I put thousands and thousands of notes up like that. My that's, main... that's really interesting. That be, reminds me, I, uh, I just was listening to this podcast on these like AI systems and the way you described it seemed to mirror how they're programming <laughs> this like generative AI um, yeah. because it, it kind of like it, it has the same problem it can't just like you know see it and reproduce it in the same way like someone's doing the form like you're saying but it does like have this like it does one step at a time like no and then it goes on as like all right I'm not happy with that or here's here's where I'm happy with that relationship and it's just like one step on so it's the same it's very so interesting yeah well, my main work so far is called Opus One it has got out to about an hour and 15 minutes eight movements and uh i'm trying to work on an opus two but i can't that opus one i started in may of 1975 working on it when i didn't have a computer and so it's almost a 50-year effort so that's one reason why aging is such a hideous thing because you're not finished with your work you know and uh, I bet a lot of people listening to that could say, well, I could see how you might make it better. I'm still trying yeah. to make it better. And then I've yeah. got an open two I've started to. Will I live long enough before cryopreservation to finish opus two? I don't know. We'll see. That's great. Yeah, um, I would definitely love to um, listen to that sometime. And maybe we can have a part two of this conversation again. Uh, maybe later. we can. Yeah, and, and just thank you, Mike. Um, you know, I really enjoy seeing you in the monthly gatherings and just to hear your insights about the truth of terrorism as well. Um, so just, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Derek, for having, having this interview. Yeah, this has been great. And, and again, so I think this concludes uh, the first podcast of Open Doors, uh, look into cryonics, AI, immortality, and everything spiritually scientific in the world. So uh, thank you guys again, Teacher Derek, Michael Perry. And uh, again, I'm Swami G signing off. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, let's see here.